Let's bow our heads. Father, as we open your word together, we pray for your blessing that our hearts will be open to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. The title this morning is Blue Sapphire, and I had a great story about Blue Sapphire. This morning, my story blew away. <laughs> and let me give you this story about the story. So years ago, I heard about a fellow who went to a rock show. Turns out it was the Tucson Rock Show. I didn't know that then. Uh, and at the rock show in one of the little cheap bins, he found a rough rock. And he thought, oh, that might be worth more than they think it is. He bought it for 10 bucks and appraised it for 2.4 million. Blue Star Sapphire. Whew. Yeah, what a find. And as I was ready to preach the sermon, I thought, I'm going to go find a picture of that rock because it's got a name for that particular rock. And I went and looked up that particular rock by name. And sure enough, I found a picture of it and also a story that says, uh, well, probably that other story isn't really true. <laughs> for one thing, the guy up at the Smithsonian says, yeah, technically that's a blue star sapphire, but it's really a muddy gray. It's not a good sapphire. It isn't worth $2.4 million. It might be a couple hundred bucks. Ooh. And the guy who appraised it for $2.4 million, he got kicked out of the appraiser's society for over-appraising stones. Ow. And two years before this time when we supposedly found the rock at the Tucson show, a, a similar rock of identical weight was appraised by the same guy. Mm. So it wasn't a new find. They already had this rock laying around and they decided to cook up a story and try to get it to a higher price so they could make more money off of it. And last we knew, the guy still owns the rock and he'll sell it to almost anybody for almost any price you offer him. <laughs> it was a scam. It was a scam. It was a great story, wasn't it? Great story. <laughs> great story. Yeah, when I saw the stone in this, after it's all polished up, it's... Nah. I'm, I'm thinking nice, clear, bright blue. Do you know what a star sapphire looks like? It's got kind of a white six-point star that runs through the middle of the stone. And you polish that off. It's like, whew, they are pretty. And, and a nice, rubies and sapphires are the same mineral. One's red, one's blue. So when you think about a nice, clear ruby, a nice blue one is a sapphire. So anything of that mineral that isn't red is a sapphire. So yes, technically this rock is a sapphire, but it's, it's just okay, kind of pretty rock. <laughs> That's not worth what he said. Exodus chapter 24. Exodus chapter 24, beginning in verse 9. Then Moses went up, also Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone. And it was like the very heavens in its clarity. Nice, clear sapphire. This was good sapphire. But on the nobles of the children of Israel... He did not lay his hand, so they saw God, and they ate and drank. Seventy of the elders, and Nadab, and Abihu, and Aaron, and Moses all went up the mountain at God's invitation. And they sat down in his presence, and he fed them a meal. That's cool. What was the deal with this meal? They're making the covenant between God and the nation of Israel. And, and they often had a covenant meal when a covenant was formed between two parties. And so God is serving the covenant meal to the leaders of Israel up on the mountain. And he seats them down up there. Trust me, up on any mountain in, in the Middle East, there is no nice, flat, paved, sapphire spot up there. It's not there. God brought it. And had it for the occasion. He catered it in, I guess, for the blue sapphire that they could sit on while he has his throne on that sapphire and ate their covenant meal together. 
God's throne sits on a pavement of blue sapphire. Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 26. Ezekiel has been describing or trying to describe to us what he saw. God's moving throne with the cherubim and all the things that go with it and the fire and all. Verse 26. And above the firmament over their heads was the likeness of a throne in appearance like a sapphire stone. And on the likeness of the throne was the likeness of appearance of a man high above it. This is God sitting on his throne. And it says his throne looked like a what? A sapphire, a sapphire stone. So the pavement under his stone is sapphire and the throne itself is sapphire. Uh, God has something in mind that he uses sapphire for his throne and the pavement. Try to tell us something about it. Sapphire is beautiful. It's a gorgeous stone. Very pretty. And if you get a good one, not a scam one, a good one, they're valuable. I mean, nothing, nothing the value these guys were claiming. You can get a pretty good one, a lot less than that. But still, uh, there is value in it. It is worth and valuable, beautiful, a thing to be desired for its, for its worth and its value. And his foundation of his throne is represented by a blue sapphire. A blue sapphire. Exodus 24, verse 12. So we're right back where we were briefly ago. And we're going to pick up the next verse. Exodus 24, verse 12. Well, I've got to get in the right book. <laughs> I overshot and got to Genesis. <laughs> Exodus 24, verse 12. Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and be there, and I will give you tablets of stone and the law and commandments which I have written that you may teach them. So Moses goes up with Joshua. They spend six days, seven days waiting before God calls them into his presence. Uh, and on the seventh day, they come up into his presence. And, and here God says, I'm going to give you the tablets of stone. Uh, it, it, but it has something in the Hebrew that the English doesn't show. You don't mind if we do a little Hebrew lesson? Uh, let, let, let's dig into it. So I found a, a, the Oxford Jewish Bible, and it translates it. I will give you the Lukot Ha'even. The Lukos, the tablets, ha even, of the stone. But the ha is the, and even is stone. Uh, there was a moment where uh, Samuel set up a stone and called it Ebenezer. Hitherto the Lord has helped us. This far God has helped us. And he named the stone Ebenezer. Eben, or even, B and V are the same letter in Hebrew. It depends on where it is in the word, whether it's a hard B or a soft V. Same letter. Uh, Ebenezer, Ezer is the help. So it's the stone of help. So Evan, here it's Lukoch Ha Evan. Tablets of the stone. There's a the in there that doesn't come through in English. And the only stone in the immediate context here is the sapphire of the pavement where God's throne sits, or the throne itself, if you consult Ezekiel. God says, I'm going to give you tablets with the Ten Commandments written on them, made of the stone that we just talked about. 
the sapphire. I'm going to take a chunk out of my throne and write my law on it. There is a close, integral connection between God's throne and his foundation and the blue and the sapphire and his law. The blue sapphire represents his law, which is the foundation of his throne and his kingdom and his character and the way he, way he deals with his whole universe. The blue sapphire stone, the stone, is what he wrote the Ten Commandments on. So if you could find the one that Moses broke, you get pieces of blue sapphire. <laughs> That's not just pieces of polished granite, folks. That's pieces of blue sapphire. That'd be worth finding. That'd be worth finding. Uh, but we have what God wrote on that stone. And what God wrote on the stone is worth more than all the pieces of the tablet Moses broke. The real value is the law itself. Not sure I treat it the way I should. Not sure I give it the value in my mind that it really has. It's kind of easy for us to look at the law as just a checklist or suggestions or sometimes almost an irritation or an inconvenience or obligation. It's description. of what good looks like in God's universe. What he's like. What he wants us to be like. Numbers 15. What Roger read for us. Speak to the children of Israel. Uh, Exodus, sorry, Numbers 15, verse 38. I gotta tell you where to go, sorry. Chapter 15, verse 38. Speak to the children of Israel. Tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations. Then you get various translations on the various words in here. The idea is you're going to end up with a blue edge on your garment. A blue edge on your garment. If you do it the way God suggested to the Israelites you will be standing inside a circle of blue. And God says, I want you to remember all the commandments of the Lord to do them. That's what that blue edge is there for, is to remind us of what the blue of the sapphire is about. It's his law. It's his law. Draw a little circle around yourself. Paint it blue for my law and remember my commandments and live inside that. Live inside that. That's what I want you to do, says God. Now, they were going to live in a land with lots of other people who didn't believe in God, Canaanites and others all around and their neighbors and people left in the land and whatever. And God is saying to them, I want you to understand that you're different. And to understand that you're different and help you remember that, I want you to put blue on the edge of your garment. The other guys aren't wearing blue. They'll know, and you'll know. They're not the same you are. They don't have the same relationship to me, and to my will, and to my law. I want you to live inside that circle of blue. That loyalty to God, that loyalty to his commands, you live in there, you will do well. Start straying out of that, You'll be in trouble. You'll be in trouble. I want you to live inside that circle of blue. Remember all of my commandments to do them, it says in verse 39. And then 
verse 40. And that you may remember to do all my commandments and be holy for your God. Holiness. Living inside that blue ring is holiness. I want you to live inside my commandments. I want you to be holy. I want you there. First Corinthians chapter nine. First Corinthians chapter nine. Verse 19. Is where we'll begin. Paul runs a play on words here that I have not found him doing anywhere else. And I haven't found other writers in the New Testament doing it either. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. And to the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might win the Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. Now, Paul talks about being under the law many places. To those who are without the law, as without the law, not being without the law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Again, the English doesn't do justice. We're going to do a little Greek now. <laughs> Verse 20, where he says, To those who are under the law, I became as under the law. And in Greek, under the law is... And I may have shared this with some of you. Some of you might actually remember this, but there's a bunch of new people here who couldn't possibly have heard this. So I'm going to share it with all of you like you didn't hear it before. And some of you will remember it and say, oh, 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 I remember that. <laughs> so uh, under the law is hupo nomos. Nomos is law. Deuteronomy, the nomi in Deuteronomy is the law. Deutero the second, second giving of the law. Moses repeats it in his final sermon. Deuteronomos or Hupo nomos, under the law. Hippopotamus, under the river. Hypodermic, hupo dermis, under the skin. Hupo nomos, under the law. You're under the law when you're in trouble with the law. That's Paul's basic use of under the law. Uh, and, and he's probably also talking about people who relate to it like the, the Jewish people do. Then he talks about those who are without the law, and that's a nomos. Atheist, atheist, no God. A nomos, no law. People who believe there is no law. Uh, and so he says, if they are a nomos, I live like a nomos. I'm not really a nomos. I'm really, and then in verse 21, he says, under the law toward Christ, but in the Greek, he doesn't say under the law toward Christ. He says, en nomos, in the law to Christ. He's talking about the blue ring again, that concept, in the law, not under the law, not away from the law, but in the law to Christ. Live inside there. That's where it's safe, actually. I, I've heard some people describing the, the, the Ten Commandments as the way God could tell us his requirements that leaves us the most liberty and the least restrictive. Because God could say, instead of saying, don't kill, don't commit adultery, don't steal, uh, don't bear false witness. Don't covet. He could say, do this, do this, do this, do this. And if he specifies all the things you do, then that's what you have to do. And that's all you get to do. And that's pretty restrictive. What God did was he put a fence up around the sinkhole and said, don't go in there. 
The rest is okay. Don't go in there. Don't fall in the hole. Put a fence so you'll know. Don't fall in the hole. Don't fall in the hole. Uh, God's trying to keep us away from the trouble. But the flip side of that is, in the positive sense, we live inside the circle of his law, of his will, uh, inside that blue line on our clothing. Now, he doesn't mean for us to do that literally now, but he means for us to catch the point, catch the point, that his law is not intended to be uh, a judicial code that I consult. It's intended to be a way of thinking. Our desires are to be shifted and changed into that image, like him, like him. God's pretty good, right? Have you ever found God not to be good? Now, sometimes I don't understand what he's doing. But I've always found him to be good. And the ones where I didn't understand and it didn't make sense, they all come around. Where I, I come around. Where I get to understand them ultimately. And it does make sense. And it is always from a heart of love that God acts. It always is, and he wants us to become that in our hearts. So that's the way we live. If that rock that he found at the fair, and he didn't find it at the fair, but anyway, had that been real and true, and the rock really was worth $2.4 million, that'd be worth a lot to have. What God is saying is, You've already got this thing. I've given it to you. It's of extreme value. And it's very useful. My government is founded on that foundation. <laughs> it's the platform that my throne sits on. It's what my throne is made of. It's what I'm made of. It's what I want you to be. It's all about law, not in, a, not in a checklist, legalistic sense, but in a changed heart by the grace of God sense. That's what he wants us to be. That's what he wants us to be. I'm going to save the rest for another time. I was going to share with you some things from John Wesley about God's law. Carol and I were on vacation driving back and forth to Minnesota, and we took the time to listen to a recorded version of a bunch of the chapters of Great Controversy, because we're going in September on a tour of Reformation sites in Europe. And, and the preparation is to read some of these chapters in the Great Controversy that deal with the things that happened at the places we're going to go see. So we were listening to it, and, and when we got to Wesley, I was surprised to hear how clearly he could talk about the perpetuity of God's law. It's still here. It hasn't gone anywhere. And yet the fullness of the gospel. He's got those two. He can explain it good. I'll, I'll save that another time. We'll, we'll share that part together. But for today, that blue sapphire beautiful, valuable, uh, incomparable worth. It's the foundation of his throne. It's his law. It's his will. It's his character. And he wants us to live inside that blue circle all of the time by his grace. That's his goal for every one of us. Lord, thank you that you have given us your word. And thank you that you have given us a knowledge of your character, your will, your ways. Help us to value your law for what it truly is. To treasure it. To allow it to shape our characters by your grace. May we live inside that circle of blue. In Jesus' name, amen.